Welcome to this lecture series about set theory and the foundations of mathematics. In this lecture series, I will introduce various set theoretic concepts, including cardinality, ordinals, cardinals, and much more. I will assume that you are comfortable with proofs, basic set theory such as unions, intersections, and some axiomatic theories such as group theory or the real number system. This video will be introductory. I will talk about the history of the axiomatic method, about the differences in approaches between ancient mathematics and modern mathematics, about Russell's paradox and the necessity of an axiomatic set theory. Finally, I will compare axiomatic set theory to other axiomatic systems and in particular to group theory. Let us begin. One of the major achievements of early mathematics was certainly the Elements by Euclid. This is a series of books where Euclid attempts to prove many theorems about plane geometry. What's important to us now is that Euclid followed the axiomatic method. That is, he developed a series of axioms and postulates, that you can see here, to prove the theorems about plane geometry. This is one of the crucial steps in mathematics. It's the first time that such a systematic list of axioms was given. However, mathematics was still very much bound to the real world. That is, the major role of mathematics is to describe the real world. The axioms of Euclid were seen as statements about the real world. Euclid's axiom system can be seen here. So, the axioms 1 to 4 are very straightforward. They state, axiom 1, to every two points there is a unique straight line. Axiom 2, every finite line segment can be extended to a straight line. Axiom 3 gives the existence of circles with a given center and a given radius. Axiom 4 says that all right angles are equal or equivalent. Axiom 5 is a bit more tricky. It is a parallel postulate. And it's very controversial. Let me first describe what it says. It says that given any two lines, straight lines, and any line intersecting them, then we can look at the inner angles, let's call them alpha and beta, and if the sum of alpha and beta is less than 180 degrees, then the two lines intersect. Intersect on the sides of the inner angles. Now, this is controversial because it isn't as simple as the four previous axioms. It looks more like a theorem that can be proven. And for centuries, for decennia, for millennia, mathematicians attempted to prove this axiom from the, from the previous four. It was Playfair which who gave a much more easier version of the parallel postulate, and which is the version that we know today, that says, given any line, given any point, not on the line, there exists a unique line parallel to the previous line, where parallel means that the two lines do not intersect. What about the proof of the parallel postulate? Is there a proof from the previous four axioms? Well, it wasn't until the 19th century that mathematicians like Gauss, Lobachevsky and Bolyai gave a conclusive answer, but also a controversial one. And the answer involved non-Euclidean geometry. These are very weird geometries, where a given line and a given point not on the line may have no parallel lines to begin with, so any line intersects the previous line, or that to any given point not on the line, there exists multiple lines parallel to the previous line. These are very weird geometries. Here are some examples. The first example of non-Euclidean geometry is spherical geometry, and is just geometry on the sphere. So um, the pair of the lines are here great circles. So circles passing through both poles or circles like this.
Anyway, we can see easily that any two lines, any two great circles, will always intersect in exactly two points. So, for example, these intersect here. So, in particular, given any straight line, and any point not on the line, there is no single line parallel to the previous line. Another and more striking example of the Euclidean geometry is hyperbolic geometry. In hyperbolic geometry, it is possible that given a straight line, so for example here, and given any point, there is an infinite number of lines which do not intersect the previous line. This is because the space of the hyperbolic geometry is curved and thus the lines do not need to intersect. This was a very controversial answer to the parallel postulate because the non-Euclidean geometries did not represent anything in the real world. For example, the hyperbolic geometry did not represent the space which is flat. However, as time, grew, as time goes on, mathematicians accepted these geometries as natural. Now, it was not until 100 years later that non-Euclidean geometry came back with a vengeance. It was the work of Einstein, of general relativity, that showed that space is in fact not flat, but space is in fact curved. So non-Euclidean geometry does in fact describe space. But, of course, the mathematicians of the 19th century, who developed non-Euclidean geometry, were not aware of this connection. This attachment of mathematics to the real world was not only apparent in geometry, but also with relation to the notion of the infinite. 19th century mathematicians, and before, only worked with potential infinity. For example, the, real, the natural numbers were seen as some kind of limit process. So we have the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, we never really looked at the actual infinite sets, but only at some kind of limit procedure, only at finitely many numbers, which could grow arbitrarily large. But it wasn't until Cantor that actual infinity was actually studied. It took so long because of certain paradoxes discovered by Galileo. One of these paradoxes says that there are as many even numbers as, odd no as natural numbers. Indeed, I can pair up the natural numbers with the even numbers. So I can pair up 1 with 2, 2 with 4, 3 with 6, 4 with 8, and so on. In general, I can pair up n with 2n. So in that sense, there are as many even numbers as natural numbers. But this is counterintuitive because the even numbers are a subset of the natural numbers. So how can there be as many? Cantor gave many beautiful answers to this, but his theory was rejected by contemporary mathematicians of the time, such as Kronecker. It went as far that Cantor became very depressed and refused to do mathematics anymore. But Cantor's set theory had many problems, and it could all trace back to his very loose definition of a set. A set to him was any possible collection that satisfies a certain property. For example, there is a set of all animals, and we denote this, as usual, by the following. So all x, so that x is an animal. This isn't a very mathematical example. More mathematical examples are, for example, the following. All x, such that x is real. Or, for example, all x, such that x equals 2. This is all very fine and dandy. But Russell came up with a very weird set. And this is the following set. 
the sets of all sets x such that x is not an element of itself. Now how can a set possibly be an element of itself? That already sounds very counterintuitive. But nobody says that it's not allowed, so we will allow it. Now, what's the problem with this set? So let's call this set R. We can ask whether R is an element of itself. Now, if R is an element of itself, then R must satisfy the property defining R. And the property defining R is that R is not an element of itself. So this is a contradiction. However, on the other hand, if R is not an element of R, then R does not satisfy the property. And that implies that R is an element of itself. And this is also a contradiction. But either R must be an element of itself or not an element of itself. There is no other possibility. So this is a paradox. What then is the resolution of this paradox? Well, of course, Russell's paradox used weird things like a set being an element of itself. So I can choose to disallow this. But this does not save us. In fact, there are other paradoxes which then show up. The actual answer is that the notion of a set is too broad. And thus, we need to restrict what the notion of a set is. And this leads to axiomatic set theory, which describes precisely what a set can do and what a set cannot do. One of the most popular axiom systems is the zermelo frankel axiom system. Sometimes, includes choice, the axiom of choice, which we will see later. Shorthand for Zimmel Frankel, ZF, and if you include choice, you will write as ZFC. The Zimmel Frankel axiom system is suitable for the vast majority of mathematics. But occasionally, mathematicians have need for a more flexible system. For example, category theory can never be done in ZFC. So we need a more broad more flexible axiom system. This is given by the axiom system of von neumann bernays gödel This is usually denoted by the shorthand NBG. Another solution are that we include in our set theory the notion of large cardinals which we will see later. Are we then free of paradoxes? We know Russell's paradoxes will not show up anymore, but are there others? For years, mathematicians such as Hilbert searched for an answer. They searched for a proof that paradoxes do not show up. But Gödel, the same Gödel as NBG, showed in his incompleteness theorem, said it is impossible to prove that paradoxes do not show up. It is impossible to prove that ZFC is consistent. This gives a very negative answer. This was a very much a surprise to mathematicians of the day. Andrew Weil states, God exists since mathematics is consistent, and the devil exists since we cannot prove it. Finally, I would like to compare the axiomatic set theory to a more conventional set theory, such as group theory. Both systems are founded on axioms. For example, one of the group theory axioms is associativity, which of course states that we can interchange brackets. Likewise, one of the axioms of set theory, of ZFC, is that there exists an empty set. So these are examples of axioms. So far, they all look very similar. They are both found on axioms. But there is a very different flavor to set theory. And the difference is that set theory lacks models. Intuitively, a model is any entity, any collection, which in fact satisfies the axioms. For example, the model 
of the group theoretic axioms is just a group. Examples of groups are all familiar to us, like the integers, the reals, and even some finite groups, like the group with two elements. However, set theory lacks these models. We can never give a definite collection of sets and then say that this collection is a model of the set axioms. So we cannot give a precise description of what a general set looks like. We can only rely on the axioms and derive statements from the axioms. However, it will be a good intuition to think nevertheless that we are dealing with some hypothetical model of set theory. We call this a universe. A universe, of course, doesn't exist. It is merely hypothetical. Now, just as we have multiple groups, we should think of the set theory axioms to imply that there could be multiple universes. And each universe then has very different properties. And this shines a very different light on controversial problems like the continuum hypothesis. The continuum hypothesis, which we will undoubtedly see later, is a statement that cannot be proven from the set theory axioms, but which can also not be disproven. This came as a huge surprise to people in the day, and it also comes as a huge surprise to people right now. But if you think of the set theory axioms to in fact give rise to various universes, then this really shouldn't come as a surprise. Indeed, look at the notion of commutativity of a group. For example, we can say that a group is commutative if it satisfies the usual property. Now, there are groups which are commutative and there are groups which are non-commutative. This means that commutativity cannot be proven from the group theory axioms, but cannot be disproven either, so it's just like the continuum hypothesis. So, there are groups which are commutative and groups which are not commutative. So, commutativity in fact separates a class of groups into two classes of commutative groups and non-commutative groups. Likewise, continuum hypothesis separates the universes in universes which satisfy it and universe which does not satisfy it. And thus we can look at the continuum hypothesis as given some kind of new axiom. This is a very useful way to think about set theory. I hope you enjoyed this lecture series. I see you next time.